Can I just start with prayer? Lord, we thank you for this morning. And Lord, I'm aware of this unique uh, and, and privileged place on stage to be able to deliver God's word. And I just pray humbly that you would use this servant, Father, and that it would not just be my words, God, that I would carry your heart to your people and your seed would plant in great soil today. God, may your people hear and listen and respond. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So if you've been here a minute, we're in a series. The gospel comes with a house key um, from the great book by Rosaria Butterfield on hospitality. And as you know, we've been defining hospitality differently than what you might major in in college. If you're a hospitality major or you uh, have watched HGTV and different shows about hospitality and decorating and food and restaurants, and that's one form, but the hospitality we want to address, we've been unpacking, is the one that comes right from the heart of God, that our God is a God who welcomes. That's at the very heart of the gospel, that you have not been saved to be slaves or to just be in the distant quarters of servants, but you are brought in as an adopted child of God who is loved just as much as God loves Jesus. That's just mind-blowing, that God would welcome not just strangers, but enemies. So we all know agape love is what comes out of God. That agape love is demonstrated tangibly in, in hospitality, which is why we've been unpacking this week after week. What does it look like for our church to look like God? And that means to be hospitable at one level to each other, because if we can't do it here, it's going to be difficult doing it out there. But the hospitality really becomes agape love level hospitality when it goes out one way with no expectations of it coming back, right? Which is why there's all these commands about loving and showing hospitality to the poor, to the marginal, to the vulnerable. Because there, as you love in that direction, it meets the threshold of agape. You expect nothing back. It's one way. And that was the love God poured out on us, where he gave himself through his son Jesus unconditionally to us. And so we've been focusing on uh, hospitality, specifically hospitality to those who are most marginal and, and most broken and most in need, most vulnerable in our city. And, uh, and Jesus says, you'll always have these people. You'll always have the poor among you. Not as an excuse for us to go, oh, well, then so be it, but as an indictment as a greater revelation of the curse that's at work in this broken world, that there will always be injustice and those who oppress and those who, through their own sin, fall into all kinds of dysfunction, all that working together in this big mess, we're going to have that until Jesus comes back. But there is a hope for this world. It's called the church. And God has given the church to be the expression of Jesus to the people who are most in need. And which is why last week we, we looked at a packet of almost 100 verses. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, and that's just a sampling of 2,000 verses on justice, over 2,000. So if you're asking, Pastor, are you turning this church into a social justice church? I don't know when those two things were separated. Whoa, say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I read this uh, someone forwarded me this quote uh, from Bishop Tutu, Desmond Tutu. Every church should be able to get a letter of recommendation from the poor in their community. That somehow if we're not expressing gospel quality, agape love to those most in need, we're actually failing a huge part of our call to be the church. Because we're supposed to be salt and light in this city. And Isaiah 58 spells out that light in works, not just in preaching of the gospel, that's absolutely critical and fundamental, but alongside that, the gospel fleshed out is tangible acts of love. Let me throw some verses up real quick. A couple samplings from that packet. Uh, next slide. James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. This is New Testament, by the way, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Next slide. 1 John 3. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Here is John, the apostle of love, spelling out agape, the love of Jesus. He says, beyond just what you feel, it's got to be out of our exhaust pipes as action and truth. And so I've been exhorting us, what does it look like for Renew, for the 500 plus people who gather here each Sunday to love the city as God loves. And today I'm really excited to, uh, after I preach very shortly, I'm going to bring up a, a nonprofit we're partnering with called Olive Crest. We're going to help us love some of the most vulnerable in our city. And you'll hear all about that and you'll have a chance to respond. But to cue them up, to properly give them the right platform to launch and, 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 and speak to you, um, I want you to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. And turn to your neighbor and say margins. Margins. Okay, we're going to learn about how hospitality requires margins. Okay, and every talk has been kind of leading to this moment. We've been doing hospitality for the last, I think, five or six weeks, and it, it comes down to where, where the rubber hits the road and it requires margins. Look at Galatians 2, starting at verse 9. James, Cephas, also known as Peter, and John. These esteemed, those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked, you can underline that, was that we should continue to remember the poor. You can underline that as well. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. Now, let me give you some context because we're diving in. By the way, after this week, we're going to do a long series on just the book of Galatians. So it's going to be great. So I'm giving you a little teaser here. But in this encounter, um, P, uh, Paul, this is his third visit to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's kind of HQ for Christianity at this point. That's where the first church erupted. Um, that's where the uh, apostles are residing and uh, presiding over uh, the churches of Jerusalem and beyond. And Paul has been there several times uh, to be mentored, to be trained. There was, on his second visit, uh, 15 days he spent with Peter, specifically. And man, would I have loved to have been a fly on that wall. Peter, the apostle to the Jews. Paul, the apostle to everybody else. Talking theology, talking shop, probably debating a little bit, knowing Paul's personality. This is his third journey. And he's going back because he's been summoned. Because they're hearing Paul's preaching a very radical gospel. You see, one strong thought in the early church, because it was mainly evangelism to the Jews, was that you have to be Jewish to be Christian. That you have to actually follow the laws of Moses and then lay, layer on top all the Jesus stuff. But Paul was preaching Jesus and only Jesus and more of Jesus which is great news for us who are not Jewish. And so, report was coming back to Jerusalem that this gospel was spreading and impacting, and so they wanted to meet with Paul to make sure they were on the same page. And here Paul is recounting that visit, how they met, and they gave him the seal of approval. They approved his gospel as the true gospel, and they said, well, here, let's, let's divide and conquer. You reach the Gentiles. We'll continue to reach the Jews, but we're brothers. We're doing this. We share the same gospel. But here's just one thing. One thing we need to make sure we agree on. It's not fasting. It's not the way we worship. It's not even ecclesiology. The one thing, the one asterisk that the apostles made sure Paul put on his gospel, which he says he was happy to do because he was doing this anyway, was remember the poor. This is the gospel summit of all summits. Right here determines the future of the world, literally. If they did not approve Paul's gospel, I as a Korean American would not be a Christian. 
And most of you are probably not Jewish by blood, so most of you probably would not be Christian. Like this, this affirmation was critical for Paul to carry the blessing of the apostles, he himself being an apostle too, to spread the news to all the Gentile nations and tribes. This was a critical meeting. And they approved his gospel with one asterisk. Remember the poor. That's how critical it was for the gospel to be the real gospel. The gospel without remembrance of the poor is not a gospel. Because the gospel is about agape love. Agape love. Love poured out to people who do not deserve. Philippians 2, Jesus becoming nothing for enemies. And if that is not expressed in the church's love for the most broken and vulnerable in our city, then somehow we haven't hit the threshold of gospel yet. So the apostles and Paul agree. It's the gospel, asterisk, remember the poor. But how? A second and final point. I told you it would be a short sermon. How do we remember the poor? So after this meeting, Paul goes on another series of missionary journeys where he carries this message of gospel and remembering the poor, and he begins to collect money from churches to give to the poor of Jerusalem who were going through a severe famine at that time. And we'll catch up in 1 Corinthians. Turn to chapter 16. So after that gospel summit, he visits these churches and he writes letters to remind them of what he had preached after that summit and in their specific city. He says in chapter 16, verse 1, now about the collection for the Lord's people. This is Paul applying that asterisk. Remember the poor. What does remembering the poor look like? This is what he writes. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made because it's already there. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Remember the poor. Remember the poor. What does that actually look like? It looks like setting aside margins every week. This is not tithe. This is a gift to the poor. The Paul says, hey, I'll, I'll make this systematic and rememberable for you. Just every week put aside a certain amount of money, appropriate to your income, that we're going to give to Jerusalem who are starving. It's about margins. And... What Paul is getting at is a very basic truth that we happen to ignore when it comes to this command to love the poor, is that what we love, we make margins for. I know this because my wife reminds me that if I love her, there'll be wide margins for date nights and time together, not in front of a screen or a television, but like, if you love someone, you make margins, you make time. You carve out time from your schedule to devote that time to the person you love. It can maybe not even be a person. It could be a hobby you love. You carve out time and resources. You make margins to devote that to somebody. If you have children, you certainly make margins. Or they force you to make margins. <laughs> so what does it look like to remember the poor? To show agape love to those who are most vulnerable? It doesn't look like real love until it's spelled out in margins. Now, Paul isn't just making this up. He, remember, was trained as one of the most zealous Pharisees under the strictest school of Pharisees under Gamaliel. And he has all this Old Testament precedent to command this. In the ancient times, there were three tithes. There was the sacred tithe, which was kind of the general tithe to the priesthood and to the temple. That's just a 10% cut off your salary, your income, your fields, whatever. Then there was the, the tithes of feasts, because there was a lot of festivals that you had to celebrate and honor as part of being the people of God, and you had to eat. Well, where does that food come from to celebrate? You set aside 10% of your income again just to use during those feasts. That's 20% if you're counting. There was a third tithe called the poor tithe. 
This was paid every three years, and this was specifically to the poor. If you average that out year by year, that's 23.3333%. Each year, you make margins for God, for his people, and for the poor. The um, tithe that's sacred to God, the tithe of feasts, God and people as you celebrate, and the tithe to the poor, which is about 3.333% every year. On top of that, if you're like, okay, we're done, 23% a year, we're done. On top of that, turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 24. Verse 19. So remember, this is on top of the 23%. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. These are, by the way, the most vulnerable categories of their time. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That's why I command you to do this. As a caveat, if you're wondering why they were slaves for 400 years in Egypt, it seems like one commentary here is that God wants to teach them to really love the poor because they were once poor. That's a 400-year object lesson. It's very painful. So what is... That command getting at, on top of the 23%, do not over-harvest your field. Just because you have a field with grapes doesn't mean 100% of that's yours. Go through it once, and clearly you can't get everything under one sweep. But he says, that's it. That's all you get is one sweep. All the grapes on the margins, all the grapes you didn't pluck, all the figs, whatever is in your field, that belongs not to you, but to the people I also love and care about beyond you, the fatherless, the widow, the foreigner. So you put all that together, 23% you don't touch, 3% of that right to the poor. On top of that, you don't fully use 100% of the, of the stuff that should be yours. It's your field, it's your produce. You, you sowed the seeds, you planted the vines. Like That should be yours, but God says no. You get one sweet, but leave the margins there for the poor, the fatherless, the widow. On top of that, there's spontaneous giving we're supposed to do because if the poor came to your doorstep, they couldn't just be like, well, I already gave 23%. Boom, shut the door. Like there was spontaneous giving that was happening. So if you average all that out, we're looking at 30% Plus, that the ancient Jews were building margins if they truly loved God and loved his people. So when Paul is saying this, it's off a rich biblical precedent that what you have, you're not allowed to use at 100%. That God's watching. That love is spelled out in margins. Just like if you got married and be like, well, I know I got the ring, but 100% of my time is mine. How will your beloved Spouse, respond to that. If you love God, you love his people, and agape is flowing out of you, the whole idea is that you're looking for ways to find margins, to give away. That's the direction of agape, to give, not to take. So here's my simple question. What margins do you have for the most vulnerable in our society? In our city, pastor, I already tithe. Well, God bless you. It's a great place to start. Because the tithe was never law. It was a great place to begin. But the church gave far more. Because Paul is asking the churches of Asia Minor, who are already poor, to give to an even poorer area in Jerusalem. And so by nature of asking poverty-stricken churches to give, Paul's saying, I want you to give by faith, not out of comfort, not because you have so much. He actually says the Macedonian church was the church of Philippi, gave out of their extreme poverty, but gave generously by faith. And so if you're giving, even of your tithe, no longer triggers faith, 
That means God wants to push you farther because we're supposed to have gospel love flowing through us. So maybe you tithe. That's between you and God about what to give more. But we have cars. We have apartments. We have homes. We've got time. We've got able bodies. Is 100% of that yours? Do you have the right to use all of your other discretionary income? Do you have the right to use all your house for just you? Do you have the right to use your car to transport just you and your family? Or are we hearing scripture from the beginning to the New Testament? This biblical thread that runs all the way through that you are to make margins. Love is spelled out in margins. And without margins, it's just talk. And we read in 1 John that love needs to be spelled out in action and truth. That to help us, I'm going to bring up Olive Crest. I invite you up here. They're going to show us what our margins can do. And if you think, well, it's just margins, what can that do? Remember, I encourage you with this and leave. There was a time where the apostles looked, disciples looked out at probably 20,000 people and all they had were five loaves and two fish, margins. If they were to split that among 12 men, it's a small fish and bread lunchable, okay, per, per man. And Jesus says, give me your margins, break this, anoint this. He fed the crowds and they had 12 baskets left over. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Twelve baskets. It's a lesson that when you give your margins for the sake of the kingdom, God takes those margins and gives us so much more. So may you be encouraged. Hear this amazing presentation, and let's respond. Thank you, Pastor. And you like Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> Sorry about that. Cool. My name's Jaime. Um, it's great to be with you guys today. Uh, what an honor to be with you guys. Um, and I love to see just the, the mosaic of God's family um, in ages and race and walks of life. It's, it's awesome to watch. Um, I don't know if you guys realize that, but that's a gift. Um, so a um, couple thoughts of feedback, I guess, from what Pastor Dehan talked about and, and um, some other stuff that was shared this morning. But I love um, just even what the ethos of your church is all about. You know, that God is, that God has called this community to bring renewal, not only internally, but that, that, that's not kind of the end all and be all of walking out our faith in Jesus, but it's, it's for others, right? Um, and that we live in a broken world. Um, we live in a very, very broken world, and we live in a broken city. Um, I'm a native of Los Angeles, born in Echo Park, um, Dodger fan, UCLA alum, <laughs> go Bruins. I'm praying for the football season, but I don't think my prayer... <laughs> My prayers are going to avail very much. Um, and, you know, when you, when you love a place as much as I do, I love Los Angeles so much. Um, it's really heartbreaking to see just how our city is, is not what God intended it to be. And to think about what it could be if it was living out its purpose, calling, and destiny. Um, I was a missionary. My wife and I were missionaries down in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And so, you know, we got to love, love the cities of the world. I'm an urban person. I love being in the city. And uh, one of the things that we would talk about and learn was that each city has a purpose and a calling. And Los Angeles has a big purpose and calling. And I don't know if you know, but a lot of the major moves of God were birthed out of Los Angeles. And so um, I think the body of Christ here in L.A. has a calling to help reawaken that. And I think that's what God has called you as a church to help reawaken um, and saying, hey, don't forget who you were called to be. And so 
the first um, first thing I want to remind us is that the words of Jesus where he says that we are the light of the world. That's kind of heavy. Because if you were to ask me, you know, what does your life look like today? Um, I'm one of those battery, you know, one of those flashlights that's been overused and the, the like, light's kind of dimming out, you know. <laughs> and I don't have that much light to give out, to be honest with you sometimes. And yet, God called you and I to be light to a broken people in a broken city. Um, and all that he's asking for is a willing person, a willing community to say, yes, Lord, we will be light to this broken world with all of our warts, with all of who we are. And, um, and part of that is because God wants to bring glory to himself through the body of Christ through his church. You know, God, the one thing that God cannot give himself is glory back to himself. And, and the only way that that can happen is by us reflecting who he is to the world, and that brings glory to him. So as we talk about what does biblical hospitality look like, we got to ask ourselves what's going on in our community that requires that biblical hospitality. So let me give you a couple of stats um, that should kind of rattle you a little bit. It, it did for me when I first heard about them. That every 10 seconds, there is a report of abuse um, happening in our community, in our country. That every single day, five kids die of child abuse. That's an epidemic. That's, that's an issue, it, and it's huge. Um, that 60% of children caught up in human trafficking um, come from the child welfare system. You know, um, I was on staff at a church in Northeast LA for almost eight years, and I've seen kind of the trend of what the body of Christ has been engaging in. And human trafficking is one of the things that has really become an important thing to all of us. And I'm grateful for International Justice Mission and other organizations like that who are shedding light into the human trafficking issue. But when I realize that most of the people that are engaged in human trafficking come from the child welfare system, from the foster care system, I was like, we're missing it. If we really want to make a difference in human trafficking, we got to address the root of it, right? That 60% of um, children who age out of the foster care system are homeless within the first year. That's huge. You go out there into, I mean, any neighborhood that you live in, it doesn't matter how nice it is anymore. There's going to be people who are homeless close by. 60% of those people have a history of being in the foster care system. That's, that's outrageous to me. And then 60% of the kids who, um, who are from the foster care system will be incarcerated. They will end up in jail within 18 to 24 months. And it makes sense to me, having now worked with kids who are um, kids who have been in the system, who are at risk of being in the system, because in many ways the foster care system is a is a training ground for prison. And then don't even get me started on the disproportionality of African American and Latino children being in the foster care system, and then you mirror that with what that looks like in prison, and the majority of men and women in prison are African-American and Latino. So no wonder we're a mess, and yet we're called to be the light of the world. Oh my gosh, God, what do we do? Because this is too much. And then let me show you the last stat, and I'm going to stand up for this one. 35,000 children are in the foster care system in L.A. County. That is more kids in foster care than in any other state in the nation. When I heard that quote, I was like, some pastor quoted that. You know how pastors, and sorry, Pastor Dehan, but you know how sometimes pastors are like, there were 15,000 people there, and there was like five, right? <laughs> I was like, 35,000, I don't believe it. And I started Googling, like, how many foster kids are in New York? How many foster kids are in Texas? How many foster kids are in Illinois? How many foster kids are in Florida? I started thinking about all of the larger states in the country outside of California. All of them had fewer kids in the foster care system than Los Angeles County, your backyard and my backyard. And I was like, that is not okay. I am not okay with that. 
that needs to change. How are we supposed to be the light of the world when that's happening? That's just ridiculous. And let me just tell you one quick story. So when I was on staff at this church, we get a letter from the Department of Children and Family Services, the Child Welfare System in L.A. County. And they said, hey, we want to partner with the faith community. And at first, we couldn't believe. We're like, what? The government wants to partner with the church? We don't believe that. And so we had to go check it out because we were like, this is like one of those crazy, you know, schemes or whatever. We show up at this community center in El Sereno. 50 chairs set up. We walk in, and it was me, our kids' church pastor, and another staff member, and one person from a little church in Highland Park. That was it. I was embarrassed. I'm like, this this is what the church has to represent and show? This is wrong. This is about 10 10 years ago. And I'm like, Lord, we're never going to get anywhere. And yet, I have seen the Lord do some amazing stuff in the last probably three or four years of really kind of stirring the body of Christ in this, in this issue. And it's amazing to see God really calling the church to be salt and light like we talked about. And I'm excited that you guys are a part of that. But as we've been um, kind of walking through this as an organization and really seeing ourselves as a, as a servant of the body of Christ as a church, here's my message to you that there is hope. Despite all these stats, there is hope. And I love the words of Jesus in John 10.10 10, where he says that the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come to bring you life and life in abundance. That's the New King James Version. That's my old school Pentecostal uh, Bible version. I have come to bring you life and life in abundance. And here's what I envision. That those kids who are at risk of entering foster care or who have entered foster care or are aging out of the system, they have been snatched from the evil one of this world and their purpose, calling, and destiny has been robbed from them. But you and I have the privilege of walking up to the gates of hell and saying, not that one. I'm taking that one back. Not her. She's called to be a mother, an entrepreneur, a senator, fill in the blank. Not that one. And you take them back for the kingdom of God. And as a missionary, because that's kind of I will always be one, I look at them as like, they're a fellow kingdom builder, and if we don't have them, we are missing out on extending the kingdom of God in our community. And so we're not just rescuing lives. We are rescuing, God is rescuing lives through us so that his kingdom could be built, so that they could also extend biblical hospitality to their neighbor. Jesus brings healing. He brings hope and healing, not through some, you know, extraterrestrial <laughs> ET, it's you and I. And I love this, this, this uh, concept that, that the local church is God's solution, the hope of the world. It's actually um, a, a modification on, on, a, on a saying that a pastor from the Chicago area would say that the local church is the hope of the world, that you and I are the hope of the city of Los Angeles. There is no plan B. It's us. If we want to see radical change happen in our communities, it's not going to happen through government. It's going to happen through you and me saying, Lord, here I am. Send me. Lord, here I am. Here's my apartment. I'm opening it up for somebody who needs help. Everyone can do something about this. What's your something? We don't get to kind of get a hall pass for what's happening in our community with vulnerable children and families and kids in foster care. We all have something to do. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk to you guys about today is how can you be involved? How can you be a part of the solution? How can you help keep kids out of the foster care system? Because here's the beauty of it. 98% of kids who are, who um, we have the opportunity to intervene in and, and, provide them with biblical hospitality, they will never enter the foster care system. That's huge. Could you imagine? 
that 98% of those kids, if we just opened up our home and said, hey, come into my house just for two weeks while your mom figures out what's going on in her life, and mom figures it out with the help of the body of Christ and all of Christ, and then she gets her kids back, and those kids never have to experience foster care. And let me tell you, I, I didn't experience foster care, and growing up Mexican in La Puente, I should have been in foster care because my, I got my butt kicked, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But thank God I didn't. And, and I've heard so many stories of these kids of what they experience being in the system. And so we've made it our mission to come alongside the church and say, hey, we can make, we can make a difference and keep these kids out of the system. And that's, that's what we want to talk about, you, talk about with you guys today. So there's a ministry called Safe Families for Children. And basically what it is, is you opening up your home to kids who are at risk of entering the system. And I'll just kind of tell you like a, a synopsis of what that looks like, tell you th through an illustration. Typically, it's a single mom who's dealing with some kind of issue in her life. Maybe it's a medical issue. Sometimes it could be um, domestic violence. It could be pending homelessness or they're homeless already. Um, it, some kind of crisis situation that could lead to the, her making a decision or being forced to make a decision that puts her kids at risk that then requires for the child welfare system to step in and the potential for those kids to be removed from her. But she has the option of calling, say, families and saying, hey, is there somebody in my community who can take my kids in for a short period of time? And that's where you and I come in and we say, yeah, we can. I can take a kid in. And, you know, we're not asking you to have a five-bedroom home. It could be your couch. It could be a blow-up mattress in your living room. You know, if you're married and you have kids, they can sleep on, you know, on a blow-up mattress in your kid's bedroom. It doesn't, it's not fancy. It doesn't have to be. But it's really providing them, these children, with a safe and stable home so that they don't have to be at risk of entering the system. And then we come alongside the mom and say, hey, mom, because it's typically a mom and it's typically she's under the age of 30 with kids five and under. You know, we have teenagers, too, that get housed, but... A lot of times it's younger kids, elementary school and smaller. But we say, Mom, how can we help you? Oh, you need uh, housing? Okay, let's call these organizations. We become kind of a linkage, the church and all of Crest, of helping these moms get back on their feet and disciple them. Because a lot of these moms, the reason why they're in this situation is because of social isolation. They don't have a safety net. Most of us in this room have a safety net. If you, tomorrow you were get to be evicted from your apartment, you probably would have a place to stay. At least I hope you would. These women and kids don't. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we as the, the people of God were the place that people would run to when they were crying out for help instead of running away from us, right? Right? So that's what we get to be. We get to reclaim our place in the community as being the, the refuge, the place that people run to. Back in the day, like centuries ago, whenever there was a crisis in the community, guess where people went to? They went to the church. That doesn't happen anymore. And that's, you know, for another time and another sermon series. But, but, but God is calling us and inviting us to reclaim our place in the community of being where people can come back. And say, hey, Renew, I'm in trouble. Can you help me? And your answer is yes, we can help you. So, you know, some of you guys are freaking out like, oh, my gosh, I can't have anybody in my apartment. You know, I work 20 hours a day. I was going to say a week. Some of you guys probably only work 20 hours a week. Um, <laughs> so, you remember, um, it's not just about housing kids. So some of us will be called to be what we call friends, or sorry, family, welcoming a kid into your home. And that biblical imperative of Matthew 25, you know, you welcomed a stranger into your home. And what does Jesus say? When you welcome that stranger, you welcomed me, right? So some of us will be called and are called and are feeling stirred to open up our home. Um, you could be a, a family, you can be married, you can be single, you can have roommates. It doesn't matter. This isn't just for married people. This is for single people as well. You don't have to live in a home. You can live in an apartment. You just need to have space to welcome somebody in. 
Second is friends. That's for those of us who aren't able to house somebody, house a kid or kids, but we're willing to kind of come alongside those folks and say, hey, we'll support you. And so friends looks like people bringing a meal once a week or once a month, providing transportation, um, providing mentorship for the kids that are in that home, um, child care, because, you know, the people that are helping to house these kids sometimes are going to need a break, especially if they're single and they've never had kids around. They're like, oh, my gosh, I need a break. This kid's a lot of work. It's great practice for parenting, by the way, if you're single. So, hey, you know. Um, but we need a community. We need a community to wrap around us as we kind of go and do the work of God together. It's, it's like being a missionary in your own living room, right? And every missionary, I'll tell you, having been out serving internationally, every missionary needs support, a support team. So this is what it is. It's a support team that wraps around. And then the third group is for the rest of us. For the rest of us who can't, you know, house a child, uh, who doesn't have the margin for... Uh, for providing, you know, practical support. But we can do something else. We can provide, um, you know, what we call gifts in kind, um, maybe even being a part of the monthly donor program to help fund this, this ministry. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So family, friends, and champions. We can all do something about this. We don't need... Any more kids in the foster care system in L.A. County? 34, 35,000 is enough. So if you, together we can keep these kids from entering the system, let's do it through safe families. And here's the end result is transformation. Transformed lives. People are being transformed by love, by hospitality, by the margin that you create. And it's not their lives only that are being transformed, but yours as well. Let me tell you, a little discomfort is going to bring you a lot of transformation. Transform neighborhoods. Could you imagine if, the, if Culver City, Palms, Mar Vista, South Los Angeles had the love of God infused through something like this? Our neighborhoods would be transformed. Do you agree with me? And then guess what? Your church not would be, will be transformed as you create margin, as you practice biblical hospitality, as you bring those kids from those challenging family backgrounds into your kid's church, guess what? Other kids are going to be like, oh, wow, they're different. Let me learn about you. And if you have kids, this is a great way to do missional living because your kids are going to learn so much about what does it mean to live sacrificially. So at the end of the day, we're not all called to do everything. We're called to do something. So my call to you is, would you prayerfully consider, God, how are you calling me to love and serve my city through radical and biblical hospitality as we love the most vulnerable in our community, those kids and single moms who need to know that there is hope and healing for their lives that this isn't the end of their story and that their um, purpose, calling, and destiny could be reclaimed for the glory of God. When I think back on my life and my childhood, it was dysfunctional and unpredictable. From ages 9 to 15, me and my brother were back with my mom and we were technically under her care living with her while she was battling addiction. My freshman year of high school, my mom's addiction just got out of hand. She was so dysfunctional. She didn't know what day it was sometimes. She didn't know what, what, what reality was. She just didn't pay rent for a few months and we lost our home and me and my brother ended up in a motel room. I just found myself alone with all this weight to carry and not knowing what to do or where to turn and this hopelessness came over me, just realizing 
I can't carry this. I can't raise my little brother. I'm not equipped. I'm not capable or able to carry what's on my shoulders right now. I decided I can't do this anymore and I don't want to, so I planned on overdosing in a canyon by the beach. I just wanted to walk over there, overdose, and end it. A woman that lived in the motel room reached out to me the evening that I was gonna do it and she said, little girl, God is not done with you. You are not giving up. And her sharing her story with me just put this fight in me to not give up for me, for my little brother, for my future. And this hope began to flood my heart. August 10th, 2010, I woke up and I said, Lord, you know that where we're at right now isn't safe. And so I asked that you would give us a safe place to be. Within a few days is when my mom got the call from all of Crest Safe Families and said, hey, we have a family that is willing to take in both Helen and Alex while you get on your feet and we can help you just get stable. So after moving in with this family through Olive Crest, I was just given so much love and intentionality through the family that I was living with, through keeping my brother and I together. There's so much pressure on me to take care of all these basic needs that once those were taken care of for me, I didn't have to worry about what I was gonna eat or where I was gonna sleep. I just, I had never really had like a childhood where I was celebrated and given freedom to just pursue what I what I love. Um, I didn't even know I was an artist until I was 16 and living in this home where I just started playing with watercolors and playing with acrylics. I was given this experience of what family does for kids. Now I speak in my high school, I speak in my middle school, I speak in group homes and I get to share my story and who I am today with kids that can't see themselves beyond their, their brokenness. I think what Olive Crest stepped in to do was huge in preventing years and years of difficulty for me. They just set it up to where I had the space, I had the time, I had the love and the home to grow into who I am. There's a quote that really resonates with me and it, it says, be who you needed when you were younger. I really hope that that's what I can do with my life, that I can be that for kids that grew up like I did, that hope and that encouragement that I didn't have. Can we stand together? I want to call us to a response. I, I love that story. I also love the untold story of the family that hosted this young lady and just the amazing blessing they have received to be a part of her life and her brother's life by using their margins to house these siblings to now being able to be a part of their future and what God has done in their lives. I've been asking God, what's our response? And God gave me a number. I don't know if it's prophetic. I think it's just the baseline. I'm praying for at least five safe families out of this church and a lot more friends and champions. Maybe this is not your primary way of serving Project 614. We're going to have a whole, um, you know, a whole portfolio of ways we can hit, uh, impact the city. But if God is pulling on your heart in this direction, you want to be a safe family, a friend or a champion, all of Crest will be outside taking information. And in two weeks, we're going to have an informational meeting between our services where I'm sure you have a lot of questions. What does it look like? What does it mean? What are the liabilities? How do we do this well? All of Crest will be here to give you all that and to set up training dates so that we can be certified safe families and friends and champions.